We know routing is about finding a path to deliver our data from source to destination. We used an example network and we said what we want to do is find from one, one source, from a source to a destination, find the least cost paths or the least cost routes. Because when we send our data, when we send our data, we want the data to travel the, across the path which costs us the, the least amount. So with fixed routing and also with adaptive routing, what we do is somehow we need to learn about the network and then from that network information calculate the least cost paths. The least cost paths are then stored in routing tables. The paths that you created, in our example, we, for example, this was a case with distributed routing tables of six routing tables for each node. And the way that we read the routing tables is that if node four has a packet to send to destination three, then the next node to send to is five. So this is relevant for both fixed and adaptive routing. The difference between the two is fixed routing is we just discover the paths at the start. Adaptive routing, we continually recalculate the least cost paths. As the network operates, we get updates of what are the new link costs, are there new nodes, new links in the network, and when the changes occur, we recalculate the paths and update our routing tables. And a routing protocol does that for us. So you find a, a device, a node in the network, like a, a wireless router or a, a router for a, a campus, and that may be running a routing protocol that is continuously trying to learn about the network topology, learn about the link costs, and continually calculating and updating the routing tables. So the process of updating the routing tables is part of the routing protocol. The process of sending data is called forwarding, where we have data and we just look up, based upon the destination address, look in the table to know who to send it to, who to forward to. So first, well, we do routing to create the routing tables and deliver the data using forwarding using the routing tables. But we, then we come to a different case, flooding. And that's what we finished with in the last lecture. And we went through some examples, let's just summarize. Flooding is a very simple approach for delivering data. There's no separation between routing and forwarding. There is no routing table. It's very simple in that what we do is we have data to send to a node, send it to everyone. Of course, if we send that data to everyone, a copy to everyone, then our destination node should receive a copy. So instead of choosing the route first, just send the data immediately. But don't just send it across one path, send it across all possible paths. A copy of the original packet is sent to the neighbours of the source, so the source sends to its neighbours. Those that receive it then send on to their neighbours. They forward a copy of the packet to its neighbours. And at the end, the destination should get a copy. It's very simple. Okay. There's no need for running a, a separate routing protocol, no need to calculate least cost paths, no need to know about the network topology in advance. You just need to know who your neighbours are, which every node knows anyway. So there's no discovery of the network topology information needed. Just send. So very simple. Another benefit of flooding is that when you send copies of the packets, at least one copy will take, or well, all possible paths will be traversed, and at least one packet will take the minimum hop route. For example, we went through the case where we send to three of our neighbours, and then three sends to its neighbours, two to its neighbours, and so on. One copy of our packet from one destination six takes the minimum hop path 
In this case, the minimum hop path is 1 to 3 to 6. 1 sends to 3, 3 sends to 6, 6 receives the data. So it's useful if we want to send data across the minimum hop path. Maybe not the minimum cost path, but the minimum number of hops. Especially if we want to find the minimum hop path to some node. Of course, other, pa other copies of that same packet would take longer hop paths. One copy went 136, another copy went 1456. Another advantage of flooding is that we get the data to every node in the network. So although we said we wanted to deliver the desti to destination 6, actually a copy of that data got to all nodes in our example. So that's useful if we don't want to deliver to just one destination, but to, de to deliver to every node. Maybe you want to send a message to everyone in the network to update them about the status of your links. Then use flooding. Just send to all your neighbours, they now have a copy. They send to their neighbours, so they have a copy, and eventually everyone gets a copy of that data. So it's very useful for distributing information to everyone especially distributing information about the network status, the costs and so on. But it's very inefficient. To get one data packet from node 1 to node 6 in our example, we needed to send many data packets in, in the network. That's where we say it's very inefficient. We could count them. Uh, In, in this example, how many transmissions are there in the network? Well, node 1 sends three packets, so that's three so far. Then nodes 2, 3 and 4, the neighbours send some packets. What, another 4 plus 2 plus 3? So 12 packets so far transmitted in the network. 9 here plus the original 3. And then in the next round, then we have all these others, and you count them as, what, 12, 18, 22, 26, 34 packets transmitted in this simple case just to get one packet from node 1 to node 6. So 34 transmissions in the network to get one data packet from node 1 to node 6. If we use least cost routing or we route it across say the minimum number of hops instead of flooding, how many packets need to be transmitted? If we didn't use flooding but we knew th uh, to send the packet from 1 to 6 across the path with the least number of hops, how many transmissions? To get data from 1 to 6. What's the least hop path from 1 to 6? 1, 3, 6. So if we knew that path in advance, then we could just send a packet 1 to 3, there's one transmission, 3 to 6, two transmissions. So if we had routing happening in advance, to send the data, just two transmissions. But with flooding, we have 34 transmissions to get the same amount of data to the destination. That's why we say flooding is very inefficient. Because we'd like to use those... So we'd like to... Or, no, another way to think of it, if we send the data from 1 to 3 to 6, the transmissions from 1 to 4, 1 to 2 are wasteful. They weren't needed to get the data to 6. So inefficient is the main disadvantage of, of flooding and it's not used uh, except, well it's not used commonly in large networks except for special purposes like distributing information to everyone. If we need to do that, then flooding's appropriate. But if we want to deliver data from one node to one other node, flooding is very inefficient in large networks. We should first discover the, the least cost path first. Now the rules, and we'll come back to one more disadvantage. So the, the rules were send to your neighbours and the neighbours send to their neighbours. But there are a few extensions or, or exceptions there. Don't send back to the node that just sent you the packet. If I send to my neighbours, 
they're not going to send back to me because the idea is to get this data to the destination. If I just sent it to them, they know I have a copy and there's no need for them to send it back to me. So we saw that one sends to two, three and four. In the next phase, two does not send back to one. There's no need in that case. That's the basic rule. But we can make it even better by introducing sequence numbers so we can distinguish which packets are original and which packets are copies or duplicates. And so if we include sequence numbers, then we can add these other rule two and three to say only forward the packet once. If you've received the packet before, no need to send to your neighbours again. If you receive a packet which is the same from two different nodes, then you only need to retransmit one copy onto your neighbours. Those two rules, two and three, were not used in this example. Okay? Because you see that what well, two sends to three and four, which is okay, but then in the next step, so if we focus, say, on node two, it's going to receive a packet from three and it's going to receive the packet from four. If we do not have a sequence number, then what it does is when it receives those two packets, it sends copies to its neighbours, except who sent it to it. But if we did have sequence numbers, when two receives the packet from three, it realises, ah, I've already got this one before. I've already sent it to my neighbours, no need to do it again. Similar, when it receives a packet from, uh, so from three and from four, it doesn't send on to its neighbours because it's already sent to its neighbours. The goal is to send one copy of the packet to your neighbours. There's no need to resend. And that cuts down on the number of transmissions, which is a good thing. So sequence numbers are commonly used. Another feature that we saw is a hop limit. And the idea is, when we send a packet, we want to limit how many times it's transmitted through the network, how many hops it will traverse. So the hop limit is a, like a hop counter. And this example included the hop limit or the hop counter inside the packet, inside the packet header. So the number three says that node one wants this packet to go no more than three hops. And how it works is we transmit the packet to our neighbours. When the, they receive the packet, they reduce the hop counter down to two and then send it on to their neighbours. So two, three and four send on to their neighbours, but now the hop counter inside the packet, or the hop limit, is two. Next step, the nodes receive, decrease it to one and transmit it on to their neighbours. So that's the next step many transmissions there. The next step, when you receive, say, node 4 is going to receive copies from 3, 5 and 2. It decreases the hop limit to 0 and at that point says, let's discard the packet. No, no need to send it any, any further because it's reached the hop limit of, of 3 hops. So once it gets to 0, don't send any more packets. And that's why there's no next step in this case, because no node after this stage is going to send packets further. And you see that with a hop limit of three, the packet will traverse at most three hops. If the hop limit was one and instead of three in this example, what would happen? If when node 1 sends the original packet, it chooses the hop limit. If it instead chose a hop limit of 1, what would happen? Well, no, we still have a destination of node 6. I want to get the data to 6. I don't know where 6 is, remember. In this case, even though we can see 6 is over here, node 1 is just connected to three other nodes. It doesn't know where 6 is. Node 1 sets the hop limit initially to 1. What happens? It stops. Where does it stop? 
2, 3, and 4. All right, so node 1 will send to its neighbours. They'll receive a copy. 2, 3, and 4. I receive a copy. Hop limit is currently 1. Decrement to 0. OK, do not send it any further. The result would be 6 doesn't receive the data. So that's a bad scenario because the hop limit is too small, meaning that in this case, node 6 is, a, is two hops away from 1. So a hop limit of 1 means that 6 won't get the data and we've been ineffective in our data delivery. So the hop limit should be large enough to allow the data to get to the, to the destination and small enough such that it doesn't keep getting transmitted by other nodes in the network. So if we set the hop limit to 4, even though it will get to 6, the nodes will keep transmitting more times. In this case, the ideal hop limit would be 2. But in practice, node 1, which sets the original hop limit, doesn't know how many hops to node 6. So it needs to choose or, or, or estimate some value. The hop limit is commonly used in protocols, especially when there are errors. That is, if we have some scenario where something goes wrong and 4 sends a copy to 5, 5 sends back to 4, and they keep sending back to each other without a hop limit, they'd keep doing that forever. So if there's some error in the configuration of the network where they keep sending to each other back and forth, with no hop limit, that would keep happening. With a hop limit, eventually one would stop. That's used in some protocols. So our example consider the case with no sequence numbers but with a hop limit of 3. And we had another example where we introduced a sequence number. Same scenario, but uh, we saw that if we had a sequence number, there'll be less transmissions. Node 4, once it's transmitted to its neighbors once, it will no longer transmit to its neighbors again. So normally the hop limit, the sequence number, as well as the source and destination addresses are included in the header of the packet. So flooding, very simple, gets data to everyone, but very inefficient because many, many transmissions to get the data from one, to an, one node to another. A, a variation of flooding is called selective flooding. The flooding we went through is like full flooding. We send to everyone. Selective flooding is instead of send to all of your neighbours, select some of them to send to. And there are different ways to select. Could be random, round robin, probability based. Just quickly, for example, in this case, node 1 sends to all three neighbours. Selective flooding could be, okay, node 1 has a packet, Let's randomly select two of my three neighbours to send to in the first case. Okay, I select two and four, send to them. They randomly select some of their neighbours to send to. Maybe the next time we have data to send, we do it again and we may send it to different nodes. So this cuts down on the transmissions, but it means that not everyone gets a copy and maybe our packet will not get to the destination. It can be random selection, maybe round robin, which means we take in turns, send to 2 and 3 in the first instance. The next time I have a packet to send, send to uh, 4 and 2. And the next case, send to 3 and 4 and just keep swapping between the neighbours we use. So there are extensions that we will not go into any further. Flooding in large networks is mainly used now to distribute information to everyone. In those cases, we want to tell everyone something, flooding can be used. But to get from one node to one other node, it's very inefficient. You can try some other cases. What if uh, the hop limit was two? I think you can work out and uh, other conditions with flooding. Any questions on flooding? Send to everyone.
So that finishes our topic on routing. Let's just head to the end. So adaptive routing is what's used in, in the internet. We have some routing protocol that finds the paths, updates the routing tables. It, adaptive routing means that we continually update those routing tables, meaning we'll always, or more, more times, we'll choose the best path. If we don't update, we may use a suboptimal path. But it can be complex. Complex algorithms needed to select the best path. And in all cases, this is maybe an important point, there's a trade-off when we do routing in terms of the quality of the information and the overhead. The overhead is how many packets do we need to send through the network to get the data from source to destination. We want it to be low, fewer transmissions. Quality is about the information we know about the network in order to select the best path. We want more information so that we have a better chance of choosing the best path. The more information required to choose the route, and the more often you update that information, then the more overhead. So the overhead is bad. But the more information you, you gather, and the more often you update it, the, and it's not written here, the, the more chance that you'll choose the best route. There are a few side effects there that if, if we update uh, very often or too often, it may mean that we oscillate or have instability in switch be switching between paths. If we update too slowly, then we may choose a path which is not the best path. We use information which is ir irrelevant. So routing protocols need to make the trade-off there. There's an example there which we will not go through. Let's just summarize. And this is a summary not just on routing but also on the previous topic of circuit and packet switching, so about networks in general. Communication networks formed by connecting devices across multiple links. So no, no longer we're dealing with just a single link but using multiple links to get data from one node to another. Switching is the process of delivering the data across a network we went through circuit and packet switching. Packet switching is what's used in most data communication networks today and was what we will focus on. Routing is determining the path to take. And we've mentioned some different metrics like financial cost, delay, throughput, number of hops. And we've gone through strategies like flooding is one, adaptive and fixed routing are, are others. But there are also different algorithms like Bellman, Ford, Dijkstra algorithm, and many different protocols that implement those algorithms and strategies, which we haven't mentioned. In practice, circuit switching mainly developed for telephone networks and still used in telephone networks and some other networks today. Packet switching developed to be more efficient when we have computer-generated data, not people talking on the phone, but people sending requests for web pages, sending emails, and so on. And packet switching is the concept used in the internet and most new networks built today. In large networks, adaptive routing is needed because things change on a regular basis in large networks, so you need to adapt to keep up to those changes. Dijkstra and Bellman Ford are the two most common algorithms for determining the shortest or the least cost path. And that the trade-offs for different routing protocols, which, which is the best routing protocol, which is the approach to use, depends upon how big the network is. Is it six nodes, like in our example, or 600 nodes? How much data is being sent through the network? Is it just the data from three or four people, or is it the data from millions of people being sent through the network? And how often does the network change? If I build a network across Bangkok and it has six nodes, and it has six nodes for the next 12 months, versus I build a network and every day there's a new node being added to that network. 
So that, those factors impact on which routing approach should be used. There's no one best solution there. And that finishes on these topics of switching and routing, and we'll now move on to individual networks, LANs and WANs. But any questions on routing to, before we move on to your next sec set of lecture notes? Thank <laughs> you.